Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Folks in and around Amherst, Massachusetts, sometimes called her the woman in white. She was small, like a wren, with large eyes and bold, dark hair. Her voice was soft, frightened, breathless, almost childlike. And all her life, she had lived in that big brick house at 208 Main Street. And most of the time, she wore only white. In fierce seclusion, she drew the walls of her home around her like, like a coverlet. And except for a few people, her secret was safe. Like many who purposely led their lives away from the world, the woman in white had become a topic of neighborhood conversation. What did she do all day alone in that big brick house on Main? Well, the truth is, her life was as uneventful as the speculation of her neighbors was pretentious. She was the daughter of a prominent lawyer bound for the United States Congress. Better educated than most young ladies of the 19th century, she was remembered by her schoolmates for her quick wit and her comic valentines. By her mid-20s, most of her childhood friends had married and left town. And it was then that she drifted imperceptibly into a habit of seclusion. Accompanied by her little dog, she often strolled at twilight in the garden in the back of her parents' home. To those who watched at a distance, this was apparently her greatest pleasure. Flowers, sunsets, solitude, the gentle, quiet, inward existence of the woman in white. With her father's death and her mother's prolonged illness, her uneasiness with strangers became a fear, and then the fear over time grew phobic. Then her mother died, and she really was alone, left to her secret self. The years passed. Glimpses of her were fewer and fewer between. In May of 1886, the woman in white followed her beloved parents into the hereafter. She was 56. No longer would school children stop outside the big brick house on Main Street and dare each other to knock on the door. No more would the reclusive lady's face be seen through the curtain lace, nor her silhouette in the garden at sundown. Discovered among her personal effects and private papers were these handwritten words. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? But the woman in white, uh, nobody all of her life, would after her death forever be a somebody. That is, as Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story. Her private papers, written in the solitude of her room and guarded like a secret journal while she lived, comprised the myriad of descriptions of life as she saw it. Tiny ecstasies and candid intuitions. With language stripped of superfluous words, she wrote for her eyes only poems. 1,775 poems. This was the secret joy of the woman in white, the young lady irresistibly drawn out of her cryptic self whose entirely uneventful life was spent in seclusion, yet the, she explored the depths of human emotion, often reflecting her personal experiences of isolation and loneliness, culminating in the immortal art of Emily Dickinson. Welcome to the third week in our current series entitled Praying Human, the Psalms. And there are 150 Psalms in this wonderful book of the Bible. And there's no possible way that in a few four short weeks I could do justice to all of the Psalms. So instead, this is more of an introduction or maybe a reintroduction to the Psalms. And hopefully it'll be enough to pique your curiosity and drive you into reading and praying more of these in the days and weeks and months ahead. Each week during this series, we've been taking a different human emotion and seeing how it is expressed in a single psalm. Now, granted, the psalms are so rich and so diverse, each psalm often has a variety of emotions that are contained within, so our one focus each week isn't the only emotion that we find in the psalm. But we began the series with fear. Last week, we turned to anger. Today, we focus on loneliness. Loneliness continues to be a significant issue in our nation. Recent surveys show that one in three Americans report feeling lonely at least once a week. 
And 10% of us say that we experience loneliness daily. Younger adults, especially those in the 18 to 34 age range, are particularly affected by loneliness. Approximately 30% of these young adults report feeling lonely every day or at least multiple times during the week. Researchers believe that a combination of increased use of social media, transitioning life stages into college and out and into careers, uh, fewer face-to-face -face interactions all may contribute to this feeling of loneliness in this age group. Single adults are nearly twice as likely to feel lonely on a weekly basis compared to married adults, 39% of single adults compared to 22% of married. This trend is particularly strong among younger singles who may be more socially mobile but experience fewer stable relationships. Loneliness is common among those living alone, especially older adults. According to the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, about one quarter of Americans aged 65 and older are socially isolated, and over 40% of this group report feeling lonely on a regular basis. As people age, their social cir circles tend to shrink, which increases the risk of loneliness. But wait, there's more. Loneliness in seniors has been lift, list, linked to some severe health risks as well, including an increased likelihood of heart disease, stroke, and dementia. It's associated with higher rates of depression, anxiety, cognitive decline. Loneliness can even lead to a 26% higher risk of early death, according to studies conducted by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Doesn't that make you feel good? No. With those grim statistics in mind, I now want to turn our attention to our psalm for today, Psalm 124. And before we get started, I just want to draw our attention, if you're following along in your own Bibles or the Pew Bibles, or if you go to read this a little bit later, you'll see something that's printed before verse 1. In this case, there's a title for the psalm, Prayer for Deliverance from Persecutors. When the psalms were originally composed, they did not have titles. Those titles were added over time. Scholars believe most likely during the Second Temple period, which was from 516 BCE to 70 BCE. Now, technically, uh, there's also a, um, well, the title is considered part of the superscription, and some psalms have in italics before verse 1 also some kind of uh, descriptions. This one uh, for Psalm 142 says, a maskil of David where, when he was in the cave, a prayer. Scholars don't exactly know what a maskil was. It often means different things in different settings. But their best guess is that it indicates this is an instructive or a contemplative poem. So some scribe in Israel's history found a connection between Psalm 142 and a chapter in the life of David. And this scribe added in the margins when he, a, a, a maskil of David when he was in the cave, a prayer. Now, some think it's from 1 Samuel 22 when David found refuge in a cave uh, as he was going through a really difficult time in his life. Others say, no, maybe it was from 1 Samuel 24 when David was hiding in the cave on the run from, from King Saul and King Saul wandered into that same cave. The implication, though, is that David probably did not pray this prayer himself, but that the words of the psalm uh, gain new insight when you read them in light of various chapters in David's life. Verses 1 and 2. With my voice, I cry to the Lord. With my voice, I make supplication to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. The simple psalm, it's just seven verses long, is a deeply felt prayer of lament by an individual who feels completely forsaken. And so this prayer of lament also becomes a prayer for help. Too often when we pray, our prayers are simply silent thoughts that we lift up to God, which is totally fine. That's a perfectly acceptable way of praying. But sometimes prayers become even more powerful when we speak them out loud. It's okay to verbally say to God whatever is on our heart. Speak your prayers from time to time out loud, especially when you're going through a difficult time. And yes, God already knows what's in our hearts before the words even cross our lips. It's not like we're telling God anything new, but there's something about speaking out loud 
that changes things. Like a child coming to talk to his or her parent, the parent may already know whatever information that that child is expressing, but it's such a joy just to hear the child communicate with the parent. God must love it when we speak our prayers out loud. Verse 3, when my spirit is faint, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. So the psalmist knows God not only understands what's going on, but God sustains. God knows the ways that he or she should go. God can guide our steps. Even in the midst of struggles and sufferings and loneliness, the psalmist is going to trust God for direction. One of the old ways people hunted was by using spring traps or snares, and a hunter would set the trap and then lie await in the, uh, for the game to wander in and either uh, spring the trap itself or the hunter would be able to spring the trap to catch the prey. And the psalmist feels like their enemies have laid a trap and uh, right along the pathway where he or she must travel. And yet the author is trusting that God will help uh, maneuver them through uh, those landmines, if you will. Verse 4, look on my right hand and see there is no one who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for me. We always read this, the upcoming scripture during our staff meeting on Tuesdays. And this last week, someone jokingly said, well, why doesn't he just look to the left side? Maybe there's someone on that side that'll help him out, uh, which is kind of funny. But in the ancient world, one's counselor or helper would be said to be on one's right side. In fact, the Psalms often talk about God being on our right side. Psalm 121.5, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. Uh, 110 verse 5, the Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. Psalm 16 verse 8, I keep the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. The psalmist is going to need a right-hand man, but there is none to be found. No one who takes notice of me, no refuge remains to me, no one cares for me. He or she seems to have lost all hope. This person feels completely isolated and abandoned by all others. And this is where the psalm begins to dive into loneliness. Anyone who's been through a season of loneliness can probably relate. Loneliness at its extreme, can lead into depression, taking a heavy toll on an individual's mental and emotional well-being. Those experience, who experience loneliness frequently say they feel invisible, unnoticed, even when they're surrounded by others. There's a sense of being cut off from meaningful connections, and, and any attempts to engage with others seems futile. Once depression sits in, feelings of deep emptiness can overtake a person where even familiar joys or daily routines seem meaningless. Depression is commonly depicted as in this overwhelming weight or, or a heavy darkness that drags people down, making it hard to move or even find motivation. And some even describe it as a fog that just clouds their thinking and their ability to even see hope. September is National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. This past Tuesday, the 10th of September, was World Suicide Prevention Day. So if you or someone you know may be contemplating suicide, call or text the number 988 and a trained helper will respond immediately. What are some of the warning signs that an individual may be thinking about ending their own life? Well, for starters, talking about suicide or death, whether it's direct like, I can't take this anymore, or more indirect like, people would be better off without me. Withdrawing from social connections, avoiding family, friends, social activities, isolating themselves from others, especially if this is someone that's normally very engaged in activities. Changes in mood or behavior, so increased mood swings, deep sadness, or rage, displaying signs of severe anxiety, uh, agitation, or irritability, or even a sudden calmness if someone has gone through a prolonged period of despair. Engaging in risky or harmful behavior, uh, such as increased use of drug or alcohol, uh, engaging in self-harm like cutting or burning themselves, reckless driving, other uh, such activities. 
giving away personal belongings, especially if they are seen as treasured possessions, or preparing a will, a, a sudden interest in finalizing one's personal affairs, expressing feelings of hopelessness or worthlessness, feeling like a burden to others, talking about being trapped or having no reason to live, and saying goodbye in the sense of uncharacteristic goodbyes, like visiting or calling people out of the blue to say farewell, or sudden expressions of gratitude or apologies for past events long since. Planning or researching methods of suicide, from searching online for ways to end one's life to obtaining items like pills, guns, or other means associated with self-harm. Now, I understand that all of these signs may not be obvious in others, and a person contemplating taking their own life will probably not exhibit all of them, but any combination of these behaviors warrants some kind of investigation and possible intervention. So remember, calling or texting 988 can put someone in immediate connection with people who can help. In Psalm 142, verses 5 and 6, the psalmist reaches out to the one who has always been there. I, I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Give heed to my cry, for I am brought very low. And once again, sort of like how the psalm began, the, the psalmist is crying out to God, an intimate cry for help, trusting in God's saving power and deliverance. The Message Bible translates it this way. You are my last chance, my only hope for life. Oh, listen, please listen. I've never been this low before. James L. Mays, in his interpretation commentary on the Psalms, notes that when the psalmist mentions the, that God is his or her portion in the land of the living, it has a specific meaning. You see, when the Hebrew people moved into the promised land, the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel each got an area that they could settle in. But the tribe of Levi was not given a geographic location. The Levites were called to serve God with the Ark of the Covenant and in the tabernacle. And then they would be supported by the offerings that were made by worshipers to that holy shrine. In fact, Deuteronomy 10 verse 9 says, Therefore Levi, the tribe, has no allotment or inheritance with his kindred. The Lord is his inheritance, as the Lord your God promised him. In the Old Testament, the phrase, the land of the living, came to be uh, described for the land of Israel. And so the material support that the Levites have is turned into the liberating deliverance of God. And so when the psalmist says, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living, they're connecting with the Levites saying that we have nothing else except what God provides to care for me, for us. And we all have that. Same connection that can call upon God to give us what we need to survive. Verse 6, the second half of verse 6. Save me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison so that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. When all others turn their backs, when it seems like foes are strategically trying to entrap uh, and bring us down, we can call on the name of the Lord for strength, support, encouragement, and in grace. Because when all else fails, God will come true and through. Now, you may have noticed the, pra the phrase, bring me out of prison. Scholars aren't quite sure what this means. It's rather ambiguous. It could be symbolic, like when we feel the walls of us are closing in, and, and we can't imagine a way out of whatever current situation we're in. Or it could be literal. The psalmist may have indeed been imprisoned when he or she uh, created this prayer, this poem. If that's the case, then other parts of this psalm take on greater meaning when you realize, oh, they're literally imprisoned. But the psalm ends with this last sentence. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. And after laying their soul out for God to see the depths of pain, isolation, and loneliness, the psalmist offers one final glimpse of hope, and that is the faith community. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. We are at our best. The church is a community of faith that surrounds one another, especially when they are going through difficult times. 
right? We are stronger together. We need each other. We're called by God to stand alongside and walk hand in hand with one another. That's what it means to be the church. That's what it, what it means to be a Christian, to be Christ's followers, to be God's people. That's why we talk so often about life groups here. None of us should be doing life alone. We are stronger together. Life groups meet both in person and online, whatever fits your schedule best. We gather once a month for just an hour and a half. We talk about our lives. We share a Bible passage together, study it, answer some questions. We take time to pray for the needs of one another. And we would love for you to join one of the life groups uh, that are already going. Or if you want, we can start a new one, and I'll help you get it started with friends and family members and neighbors and whoever you want to be a part of that group. All you have to do is ask. There's a sign-up uh, place on our church app. Uh, you can call the church office. You can text or, or call me, uh, either my personal number or my Google Voice number, 661-480-6445. Methodists have long known the importance of meeting in small groups. Worship is amazing. It's important. It gets our week off right. But it's really in small groups where our souls and our spirits take root and begin to grow. And one final reminder that next week is our 24-hour prayer vigil. The fireside room is going to be here on campus transformed into a dynamic prayer room with prayer stations that will keep you engaged and active during the hour time that you sign up to be there. You can sign up if you're here in person in the church lobby or we have a sign up on the app. And if you're going to be, uh, if you can't make it in but you want to pray online, uh, give us your, as I said before, your email address and we'll send you some prayer station activities that you can do at home. But I encourage you, don't let this opportunity pass you by. It may seem like a long time to pray, but I guarantee you, you will be blessed beyond measure uh, and the, the hour will pass by so quickly. We know that from time to time, life is hard. That's just a given. And we're all, we're all going to have those seasons where we may feel alone or isolated or just lonely. It's been that way since the beginning. And the Psalms uh, embody some of those feelings. They make space for those times in our lives when we're feeling lonely. But they also invite us to reach out both to God who created us, who knows us, who loves us, who walks with us, and to the faith community where we find ourselves. And whether you've been coming here for years or if this is your first time watching this online, you are part of this community. And we want to walk with you along the way. Thanks be to God that we have this community faith, that even in uh, our down times, those dark times of life, we are not alone. We walk with one another and God walks with us. Amen? Amen.